I V M. Hey, it's been another great week on IVM. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. On Cyrus Says This Week, we have Satyan Singh, filmmaker, writer, and head of content development for AIB First Draft. His journey from doctor to writer is a fascinating one. On The Seen and the Unseen, Amit is joined by Pranay Kotastane and Hamsini to decode Pakistan's experiences with democracy. On Keeping It Queer This Week, Naveen speaks to Parmesh Sahani, author and head of the Godrej India Culture Lab. Hustle Science marks this season finale with fitness YouTuber Abhinav Mahajan. And on Geek Fruit, Tejas and Jishnu give you the greatest hits from this year's San Diego Comic Con. It's time for you to catch the third story from Croc Tales with Anand Sivakumaran. This one is called Freddy Ki Fiat Ho Gai Flat. And now, on to your shows. The government of India is trying to create the first ever law to protect your personal data and information. The Justice Shri Krishna Committee has come out with a draft personal data protection bill 2018. All this is happening in the context of a landmark judgment last year when the Supreme Court declared that Indians have a fundamental right to privacy. This bill is also coming hot on the heels of Europe's GDPR or General Data Protection Regulations. So what does the data protection bill contain? Will it safeguard our privacy or create a monstrous government apparatus? Find out on this episode of the Pragati Podcast. Welcome to the Pragati Podcast. We are your hosts, Hamsini Hariharan and Pavan Srinath. Every week on the show, we get together to discuss economics, public policy and international relations. Earlier this week, we had recorded a two-episode special with Rahul Matan on the evolution of privacy as a concept and also in practice in India's judicial history. Last week, with the release of the new draft of the Personal Data Protection Bill, we have reached a new milestone. On today's show, Manasa Venkatraman and Ajay Patri join us to break this new bill down. Manasa and Ajay are the in-house lawyers at the Takshashila Institution. They've also co-authored a discussion document and multiple policy advisories on data protection frameworks in India and ownership of data in the telecom sector. We'll be back with Mansa and Ajay after this short break. Did I just catch you on your way to work? Or did you end up pulling an all-nighter? Let me guess, you have a packed schedule for the day, the week and probably the month and the year. That's a lot for your mind to handle, don't you think? This buzzing chaos also brings tons of negative thoughts. Am I right? Try spinning that bottle in a positive direction with me, Chetna, on the Positively Unlimited podcast, every Monday on IBM Podcasts. It's time to change your life one alphabet at a time. Ajay Mansa, welcome to the show. Thank you for Thank having you. us here. All right. So there's so much that's being talked about data protection. There's a new bill out. Can you guys give us some context? What happened a year ago when we all started worrying about what data protection was, what privacy was? Um, So it's safe to say that the story started last year uh, when the right to privacy judgment came out. Um, One of the positive... uh, branches of the judgment was that a data protection law uh, come into being in India. And in order to do that, uh, it was felt that, you know, a committee should look into this matter, should understand the subject a little bit more, and then should come out with the draft, Uh, especially because it deals with something as transient as technology. Uh, which is ever shifting, ever changing. Uh, so, uh, a committee was appointed under the chairmanship of Justice B and Sri Krishna. Um, the committee released a white paper open to the public for comments in November. And after two months of holding consultations in various major cities in India, they came out with um, a draft a personal data protection bill uh, last week. And they came out with a detailed report also last week. All right. So you guys went for these consultations, right? So what was the white paper about? Um, What was this draft bill about? What did you guys do for it? Uh, So the white paper came out in November of last year. It was a fairly comprehensive document which touched upon all aspects of data protection. And what it essentially did was because India as a short background to this, uh, because India did not have a data protection law 
uh, before this whole exercise was done. What they did was they did a very comprehensive comparative analysis of a lot of other jurisdictions to see how uh, consent was operationalized in other jurisdictions, what kind of data rights individuals had, what kind of exceptions were made for surveillance and uh, law enforcement agencies and so on. And the committee did this comparative analysis and they came out with some of their own recommendations and then they threw this open to the public. Uh, so they asked for written reports, written submissions, and they also held consultations in, I believe, three cities uh, where you could actually attend the consultations and converse with members of the committee. And so that, yeah, that was, in a sense, what happened for about four or five months. Um, and then the committee took a fairly long period of time to actually distill all the comments that it received to the white paper and come out with the report and the bill last week. Um, Ajay, uh, help me get the context here. First of all, the words data protection are uh, together among the most boring in the English language. They're worse than net neutrality. Uh, and um, when the committee was set up, why were they set up? What was the need because a lot of the times, committees in government are like for death by committee, right? You want right. to kill something, so you send it to committee. Right. But here, it that doesn't seem to be the case. There's a lot of public interest in what the Sri Krishna committee is up to. So what was the premise? Uh, I think a lot of it traces back to the privacy case itself. Okay. Because it's interesting to see that the announcement of the committee was made while the proceedings in the Supreme Court were happening. This is the Puttaswami Yes, case. the Puttaswami uh, judgment that came out last year. So, as we know now, the government was uh, arguing that Indians do not have a fundamental right to privacy. And over the course of the proceedings, it became fairly clear that the judges were leaning towards uh, a fundamental right to privacy. And one of the aspects where privacy is visible is the field of data protection. And it's even more important now because uh, because of the internet, because you're generating so much data in so many ways, it's being processed in so many different ways. Uh, it, it reached that tipping point while the case was being heard. Uh, so when the matter came before the court that we do not have a data protection law and what is the government doing about it, you had the government's representatives coming in front of the judges and saying, oh, we have constituted this committee under a former Supreme Court judge and this committee will be looking into everything there is to know about data protection and what kind of data protection we should have in India. And the judges said, okay, let them do their job and... It's, it's obviously a legislative function coming out with a law, so we won't do anything about it. We will restrict our uh, mandate to holding whether Indians have a right to privacy or not. So that was the background in which it kind of became, it reached a wider audience because the privacy judgment itself was being heard and being discussed so much last year. So this yeah. is interesting to me because while the government was sort of arguing that we don't have a fundamental right to privacy, there were also moves on this, right? So yes. could another way of looking at this be that uh, maybe the government was okay with giving some sort of statutory rights on your personal data under a law that the parliament creates rather than elevate it to a right that is uh, enshrined in the constitution? That's possible because... Uh the question before the court in the privacy case reached, I mean, it had so many different colors to it, right? Did the people who wrote our constitution, did they imagine that privacy would be uh, an extension of the right to life and personal liberty? What is the scope of my right to privacy? Why can't it be a statutory right? Why does it have to be fundamental? So the court was already preoccupied with these kind of, uh, I, I don't want to say esoteric, but these really academic questions. Uh, data protection, I think, is a lot more tangible because we see it when we, I, I know I'm talking to a, a sample set 
here but we see the importance of data protection when we hold our smartphones in our hands when we log into facebook um or when uh, uh somebody who doesn't have a smartphone puts their thumbprint on an aadhaar biometric authenticator yes, right yes absolutely so or, in that way it affects sort of everyone yes yes so it's a lot more tangible it's a lot uh, and for that reason it's an easier problem to solve from the outside of course when you and and for what it's worth uh, as we uh, discussed with rahul mathan on the pragati po- in the previous episode of the pragati podcast even the previous government from around 2010 11 had started thinking about a yes. data protection privacy rules and laws of some form yes right so so it's been in the works for a while but it sort of is seeing expression now we oh. were uh, we were actually very um, when the white paper came out um, it was a massive document uh, but i think at some level the folks that are working on this were happy to see the range of issues that they raised questions on um rather than any definitive solutions that they provided yeah rather than sort of assuming things from the get go um so if if data protection is are the two most boring words in the english dictionary then um, we probably haven't heard the words consent fatigue enough <laughs> <laughs> that that is one of the biggest things that the committee sort of pondered over and uh, Yeah over the last few months we've all thought about these issues for a long time some of us are over it a lot of us are still dedicated to it so and we still have a long way to go because only drafts have come out okay so before we proceed can you just lay out the scope of what we are talking about in terms of data protection first this is about by and large about personal information right so it's not about company having proprietary information how no. many cars uber has in bangalore no it's That's not about problem. uh it's not about publicly available information and it's not about anonymized data either anonymized data is basically a uh, aggregate set of personal data sets uh, but without any name without any yeah. identification yeah yeah mm-hmm. so it's not about those two things it's just about things that help um companies identify me from my password or my biometric information or the color of my eyes yeah so the bill touches upon all the things that you would consider are essential elements of a data protection law so it gives certain rights to individuals with regard to their data uh it imposes some obligations on uh the people who are processing that data so this could be a government entity this could be a private company but if they are processing the personal data of any individual they will be subject to certain obligations under the law uh it also lays down certain exemptions so while you might have a data protection law it's it's possible that in some uh walks of life you may not wish to apply it uh so it carves out those exemptions as well uh can you give us a few examples like if i can think of it so i am giving a lot of data to facebook right first they know my name address uh, not address but name and age and a few details hmm. and then they know my behavior right? right so i go like a bunch of things i share a bunch of things i comment on a bunch of posts so they sort of have a sense of what i like what i don't like what i talk about and they also can probably decipher my social economic status how much money i spend they can figure some of that out right so all of this is now personal information um yes all of it is personal information um because it helps someone identify you as you okay uh even your if um i don't need to necessarily log into a website for example i visit uh, a newspaper uh website or an online publication and they have ads on the sides uh my behavior is still tracked so i don't need to give them a password for them to be able to track my okay. information but um on this point pavan what uh, what i've just remembered is the narrative about uh, individuals who share data and the people who collect data for the longest time we've been referring to uh, them as data subjects and data controllers and the, so i'm the subject facebook's a controller yes. uid ai is a controller yes okay This bill was refreshing in that sense because it refers to me as the data principal 
and Facebook as a data fiduciary. So uh, it kind of uh, happily shifts the narrative. So uh, wait, why is this something that we should celebrate? It's just a change in names, right? Yeah, uh, you could say it's just a shift in terminology. But uh, and this is quite clear in the report and not the bill. Uh, it's a very deliberate action on the part of the committee. So the shift is supposed to signify that the individual is at the center of the bill itself, right? So earlier you were the data subject. You were someone who was uh, on a lower threshold compared to the data controller who had that authority over you by virtue of knowing more about you. Uh, but now you are the data principal. You are the person who the entity owes a measure of trust to. And because they owe this trust to you, they are called the data fiduciary. And it's arguably a semantic choice, but at the same time, it, it helps frame the whole bill, at least on paper, as something that protects the individual. And uh, yeah, so this can also have implications in law, right? So if somebody wants to read into the spirit of this bill and where they, where you're saying it's a data principle and data fiduciary and if certain rules that are framed later violate the spirit of this law, then that can be contested in court. Yes, definitely. So, yeah. so it has some real value as well apart from the narrative value. Yes, definitely, yes. Okay. All right, Ajay. So there's this draft law out. But I want to get a sense of what the status now is and how that will change. So maybe I think the most understandable example is Facebook. And maybe we'll talk about Aadhaar as a governmental example later. Yes. So currently, Facebook, to the best of my knowledge, gives me a terms and conditions and updates to this TNC once in a while. Hmm. They'll say it'll collecting all this stuff. There's a whole host of... Uh, language there which I don't uh, always read mm. and I click agree and then they take whatever. Is that the norm right now? Uh, pretty much because this bill is not yet the law the only legal framework that currently governs any kind of data protection to a certain extent are a set of rules which were uh, framed under the Information Technology Act. Uh, these have been around since 2011 um, and they're generally called the sensitive personal data rules. Now, it's interesting to see that these rules are applicable only to body corporates. So something like Facebook would definitely be subject to them, but not something like the Aadhaar Authority. Uh, and what these rules essentially do is when you're dealing with sensitive personal data, which is a list of about eight different types of data. For example, it could be your bank account details, it could be your passwords and medical data and so on. Uh, there are certain obligations on the data controller. So they, they have certain obligations. For example, if they are transferring your data to a jurisdiction other than India, they have to ensure that the level of data protection that's afforded there it's the same as in India, which is not saying much because okay. the level of data protection in India was pretty low. Right. So, uh, like, say, Europe would have a much higher standard, yes. so it's not an issue. Yeah, so it hmm. wouldn't be an issue. Hmm. Uh, Mansa, do you like to add anything? Uh, the SPD rules, as we like fondly call them, is uh, they were there. And it's good that they were there because Facebook has to adhere to something in India. Um, but we still found that the terms and conditions that uh, came to us when we downloaded any of these apps were so verbose. Um, one of the things that the new bill tries to do is to make them simpler. It okay. shifts the burden entirely on a company like Facebook to say that it's your job to ensure that uh, you communicate it, uh, the you know all the kind of data that you're collecting to the data principle in very clear terms. Okay. Okay. So earlier the onus was on me as a data subject to ensure that I've read the terms and conditions. Now the onus has shifted to Facebook. Okay. That said, uh, under the new bill, um, so what the new bill does is it tells the data fiduciary, okay, these are the 12 things that you have to take uh, consent on from the data subject. 
and they are really detailed things. So you have to take consent from the data principal and all these things, but you have to ensure that you explain it to them in a simple manner. Okay. Now that's fine if Facebook is the only app I'm downloading, but the fact of the matter is that I have a hundred apps on my phone, right? So my major uh, worry with such a section is that the fatigue uh, of giving consent is still going to catch up. It's just a question of when and not if it catches up. Okay, so uh, Rahul Mathan was on the show talking about uh, consent, and uh, in his uh, work, and I think even on the in the work that you co-authored with him, you you talk about how we need to move beyond consent. Uh, so it's consent, maybe moving to consent plus. Hmm. So is that happening with this new bill, or is consent still the primary uh, the way in which we are dealing with private information? Uh, there is an acceptance that consent is no longer sufficient by itself to govern any data protection law. So, what uh, the draft report says is the bill uh, represents a modified consent framework. So, you have one section which says uh, data fiduciaries must take the consent of uh, data principals before they process and collect and so on. But at the same time, there are a few other scenarios which are outlined where consent is not necessary. So, for example, in certain employment-related processes, you might wish to process the data without taking consent. Okay. And not all of these are benign. One of the places where a data fiduciary does not have to take consent is when the processing is necessary for any function of the parliament or any state legislature and i'm pretty much quoting the section verb uh, section pretty much as it so is basically if the parliament wants your personal data it gets access yes and it's not defined what is necessary for the functioning of the parliament so the threshold is set very low hmm. For uh, for an activity such as this, and that's kind of uh, problematic as well. Um, to sort of take a step back to Pavan's question, and then continuing from where Ajay left off, um, the data protection bill says that consent is definitely the starting point. No, no personal data can be collected by you know a private entity without obtaining my consent first, um, and even after such data is collected, uh, it is the fiduciary's dis- uh, responsibility to show that it processed it securely. Okay. And to show that it held it securely, to show that it retained it only till such, such time as it needed. So those kind of processes are still there, which is something that we uh, proposed in Beyond Consent as well. Uh, but Ajay did raise a very important uh, point and... Uh, just to sort of continue from where Ajay left off, parliamentary processes is just one aspect of when the state can collect my data without my consent. The very next section says that, um, you know, the state can collect personal data with or without consent uh, for the provision of any service or benefit to the data principal from the state. So if I want a ration, I want subsidy some private benefit from the government they have the right to collect my data without my consent yes and this is problematic because sure sometimes the state is the only service provider no one else can give me a subsidy except for the state but that's not a function of as much urgency as national security for them to collect my data without my consent it is still uh it is still a function that is in its at its very fundamental core a service provision function so the state is still a service provider. So there could be different levels yes. of uh, they data sh- they should collect on both. Or there could yeah. be another point to this, right? Mansa, suppose say the state is providing a service like providing um, karelas to everyone. Suppose you want it and you're very okay with your data being used for it. But I don't want to avail of karelas. I don't fundamentally like them. Mm-hmm. Does this still mean that my data is going to be used irrespective of whether or not I consent to take part in this scheme? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that because there is not enough clarity. The clause is drafted in such a way that it says that 
in order to avail of a service by the state i have to allow the state to take my data mm-hmm. so and, and it extends it further right there's another rule which says for issuing any certification license or permit you again yeah. uh, the state can take your data without consent yes so like even a bank account can be considered somewhat i mean you're permitted to open a bank account right yeah and this uh, towards the end of this particular chapter there is residuary provision of sorts uh which says that if the government thinks that processing for a certain um uh, reason for for a reasonable purpose is necessary it can specify it by a notification okay and this is a fairly open ended provision which can open a big can of worms in the future if the so give me an example what does this mean uh if tomorrow the government thinks that um, it needs to know uh, how many people are using uh, which mobile service provider and by then we have reached a dystopian future where all aadhar numbers are collected to mobile <laughs> numbers uh it finds that this is a reasonable purpose uh you know because it has to track how many service providers are in india what their market shares are it can notify that it is collecting all kinds of personal data about everyone using a mobile phone uh and the reasonable purpose is to find out in national interest what service provider you are using okay so there's another level which says okay there are potential criminals using the phone network so we will get a warrant to, like that, yeah. to 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 um, tap their phones mm-hmm. which is a different bar that you set because mm-hmm. of law and order and another which says look i want good information on the uh, telecom network and the health of the country which is a more broader loser thing and i'll collect personal information for that yeah and yes. yes so the former should ideally be done on a case by case basis so you have a particular case that's pending so you uh, tap into a particular individual's phone network or whatever and get the information you need the second is more of a of a of a rule that you're creating saying for this particular type of data you don't need consent anymore okay and because the threshold for creating that exception is so low it's likely that it might be misused in the future and there are already ways to do it if it's necessary if it's or uh, if the case so demands it if it's in the interest of defense or whatever right yes uh, there is a process in place for collecting personal data on a case by case basis which is uh, happening in other jurisdiction it's happening in the us in some form under the fisa act uh, where you know they conduct surveillance on a suspect but they have to get a warrant from the fisa court to conduct such surveillance the fisa act is riddled with its own problems uh, so it might not be the best example to take but the problem with the bill in india is that there is no judicial authority granting these warrants to uh, you know collect personal data surpassing consent uh on a case by case basis yeah this was one of the comments that kept cropping up when the initial white paper was released um because surveillance in india before um, before as it happens right now is mainly under the indian telegraph act so you can imagine how ancient that system is <laughs> and i think there are some guidelines from a supreme court case from the 90s which kind of set some borders within which you are supposed to do surveillance now the hope was that as india enacts a data protection law it will also create a proper channel that authorities have to follow in order to access a person's data without that person knowing and the best possible solution would have been to provide some form of judicial oversight over that process so you go to a particular judge with a warrant you show that you have enough reason to conduct this particular activity and then the person the judge gives you that uh, permission for a particular period of time the time limit is also important yeah. but as the bill stands at present uh this is left completely to the executive 
So you have is that the status quo as well? So right now, can yes, a cop that... go to Airtel and say, "I want to f- uh, tap yes. this guy"? I am not very sure, but I think you can go to certain, I believe, secretary or joint secretary level officials. I don't remember which department. I'm assuming as a home department, but it happens. But it's entirely within the yeah, executive. But it's entirely within the executive. Uh, and that status quo will continue if this particular provision is enacted without any more changes okay all right so guys this is one thing that we should be worried about with this new draft bill right is there something else that, we, that the bill has that should worry us uh yes definitely one of the biggest another thing that was discussed a lot last year was this thing called data localization so in simple terms it means that the law can impose a restriction on you as a data controller or a data fiduciary saying you must maintain the data you collect of indians in india why? on indian territory why well the ostensible reason is that you are protecting the data of the citizens by not letting it go to a foreign territory the other argument which is less often made is it also helps your law enforcement agencies to access that data more easily right so the general consensus among most sensible people is that data localization is a very bad measure not only does it not help you deal with security threats and uh with your law enforcement um mechanisms it also hampers innovation hmm. right you have a digital economy now that is reliant on cloud based servers that are located somewhere in ireland maybe or the netherlands and to impose any form of data localization would definitely be a regressive measure there now having said this what the bill mentions is it it employs a dual form of data localization and what i call the soft data localization is that every person's data which is sent outside indian territory uh, must have a copy maintained in india okay right and the harsher form of data localization is that you just can't take this information out of the country hmm and both of them find mention in the law in the bill as it currently stands this is so bizarre right it's as if that data is in some briefcase and the briefcase can't leave the country if i as a facebook user am notionally indian and i go to the us and access it how do they classify my data it sounds bizarre no, they they've given uh, two paragraphs of reasoning on this in the report um let's leave the soft data localization out for this specific purpose uh, there is a section in the bill which says that uh, the government will notify some categories of data as critical personal data okay and this data has to be maintained in india no copy here and outside the logic is that data between countries is apparently uh, transferred through undersea cables and uh, foreign intelligence surveillance can sometimes tap into these cables and collect this data illegally okay um so in order to stop that the government can tomorrow come and say that um, so and so things are critical personal data and uh, all undersea cables dealing with these kind of data have to be stopped there will be no undersea cables constructed uh it says that critical personal data is among other things all kinds of data necessary for the wheels of the economy and the nation state to keep turning anything from my pan card number to uh you know the internal budget figures uh before the final figures are released is critical personal data right i mean m- my filing an income tax is also going to keep the economy running i would hope <laughs> at some point that's so. so bizarre i mean that's not grounded in any legal that, uh, yeah. precision it's and the other observation knuckle- that i'd like to make is uh, when i was studying about undersea cables and how susceptible they were to foreign intelligence was that it's been proven that there are more people who can uh, figure out how these cables work 
at the receiving mm-hmm. a- ends rather than go to the middle of the sea drop an anchor and then try to tap into your data because it will just alert security systems on right. both sides right. uh but just let's take a step back from looking at all of these meta problems and let's talk about what facebook needs to do if this becomes law uh first whenever anyone tries to create an account on facebook it has to tell them in very clear terms very simple terms exactly what it's going to take with whom it's going to share all of this data um and what protective uh, you know what security measures it's going to take while it stores all this data all of this has to be communicated the minute i give a clear consent and affirmative action of my consent uh the burden again shifts on facebook it is assumed that uh, all the information i give is correct information and it's facebook's responsibility now how uh, the bill ensures that facebook will be responsible is by saying that it will conduct a data audit once every year before it collects any kind of sensitive personal data it will conduct a impact assessment uh a lot of management jargon but uh, the impact assessment will basically sort of help facebook assess does it really need to collect all this data does it really need to retain all of this data exactly how what algorithms will be used to process it and stuff like that which is desirable it holds them accountable to a certain degree um and there are also heavy penalties if facebook does not comply the penalties are either 15 crore rupees or 4% of your annual turnover uh which you know a company the size of facebook and google that will be a massive amount but if we're talking about a smaller company a startup then that might be the death of the startup so um these kind of post consent protections are also there in the bill uh we have to look at the feasibility of uh of these provisions you don't want to kill a company by compliance right um and <clears throat> a data impact assessment reminds me scarily of environmental impact assess- assessments oh, which God. are currently extremely onerous hmm. and did you know that in karnataka people don't do environmental impact assessments during the monsoon <laughs> a friend yeah. i know is trying to start a, an industry and apparently they just don't conduct it in the monsoon so he has to wait another 3 months oh, wow. just to get the eia started right so i i hope there is no monsoonal reason for <laughs> data impact assessment but you know it's yeah so so you are telling us that there is a big infrastructure that's being built yeah. in terms of regulation yes. Yes. yes okay what what else is there in the bill like this uh there's a lot of leeways that uh, is given to the state Sure, we we'll discuss some of the exceptions. Anything else? Uh, in terms of, I'd just like to add one more thing that companies would have to do is create an authority within the organization called a data protection officer, who will be responsible for overseeing the company's data protection policies and so on. And this person will generally be the first, a first responder of sorts. So, if you as a data principal have a grievance against the company's policies you approach the data protection officer which is not a bad measure because it reduces the amount of complaints that will go directly to the judicial system but it remains to be seen how companies implement this measure and how well qualified that data protection officer will be mm-hmm. but this is definitely another obligation that companies will have to comply with okay what is the government doing on its side is the government creating any regulator of any sort uh under the bill several and uh, we have to be really mindful before we unleash regulators upon this country because we have seen some of them many of them fail and a few of the new ones thrive um the bill says that there has to be a data protection authority there has to be an appellate tribunal uh then there has to be data adjudication officers just a whole beast of uh regulators going around and checking if everything is in compliance so two things here one about the data protection authority if you look at the provision that outlines their duties i think there are 24 sub clauses so and the data protection authority itself is a panel of i think six people Mm-hmm. 
So there is a serious question about capacity here because not only is the data protection authority is supposed to inquire into um, the data protection policies of companies, they are also supposed to approve a lot of things. So they have to approve the audit processes that happen. They have to approve uh, data transfers that happen to other countries and so on. So will they be able to do all of this? That's a question that needs to be asked. Should uh, they be should, able yeah, to do all of this? That should be obviously the first question. Um, There's also the question of independence. Yeah. In terms of independence, so the data protection authority is appointed by the union government. Uh, but there is some semblance of consultation because they have to take the recommendation of the chief justice of the Supreme Court and so on. Uh, what is more troubling is under the data protection authority, there is a separate adjudication wing. And all the complaints which might end up with huge penalties, as Mansa mentioned, uh, will be adjudicated by these adjudicating officers. Now, the appointment of these adjudicating officers is almost entirely at the discretion of the union government. Uh, all the bill mentions is that the government will come out with the rules which specify their terms of service, their tenure, what their role will be and everything else. So, in terms of independence, which you really need of any type of judicial or adjudicating authority that is clearly missing in the bill. So, so you mean not even the kind of protections we have for, say, try or someone else? Or is that the level of independence we can expect? I will compare it with SEBI because that's something I'm more familiar with. But no, not that level of independence either. Okay. And so, you know, when I'm thinking regulator, especially at the national level, I mean, TRI is the easiest example that mm. comes to mind. But TRI's mandate is by and large so simple, right? And even that has become so complicated. They only have to deal with what, about 10 to 12 service providers across the country. They have to, there are lots of consumers and these guys are just providing, you know, internet data and a few other things. And compared to that, what we are talking about in this case is insane. And you're talking the level of complexity of a SEBI or worse, right? Yes. Uh, and considering how quickly technology itself changes. Right. And how slowly the government does. The way they can keep up with them. Let me add a layer to this complexity. The idea of this law is to just set the tone for different sectoral regulators to come up with their own codes of conduct. So the complexity is going to be multifold. Because there is compliance under this law. Then try or, um, you know, the um, FMCG or NASCOM might come up with standards that they have to comply with uh, under, you know, their own sort of sectoral right. specification. RBI will come out with its own things, updating its banking law. Um, but there are already yeah. rules around how banks cannot simply disclose your information, right? Yes, yes. So, so the, the complexity is... if. Anything going to increase. All right. So a lot about, you know, all these debates on data protection has been, you know, the role of the state and how much discretion it has. So what about limiting state interference? Is there anything about the bill that addresses that? Um, well, that was what we hoped the bill would do. But to my mind, there is not room for that at all. Um Again, circling back to how we started this podcast, when you're regulating technology, it's very important to, much as we would like to control technology, it's like a parent trying to control a teenage kid. Much as you would like to control them, you have to just let it run its course, let it develop its own sort of practices and standards over time. Uh, that's what we hoped the bill would do. Uh, but it's not done that even for something as simple as a code of conduct that a Facebook or a Twitter has to have internally, the uh, data protection authority will release a code and this has to be followed throughout. That's wholly impractical. So that's um, like uh, some court or the government telling Uber, you should have a red color panic button on one side, you should provide yeah. a physical uh, bill using a small printer that's there in the car, which yes. is... Bizarro, right? So they're not regulating for outcomes, but for sort of inputs and outputs. Yeah. And that is the um, how divorced uh, the government might be from how technology runs, right? It's fine if that is the case, but you have to allow room to okay. develop. 
मानसा हाउ डज दिस न्यू ड्राफ्ट बिल इन्फ्लुएंस वॉट्स हैपनिंग विथ आधार दस एन ऑन गोइंग कोर्ट केस अबाउट वेदर आधार शुड बी मैंडेटरी वेदर आधार शुड बी लिंक टू योर सर्विस प्रोविजन टू बैंक अकाउंट फोन नंबर एंड अदर थिंग्स डस द बिल चेंज दैट assuming so the aadhar case before the supreme court is whether aadhar is mandatory for government related services uh assuming that it does become mandatory for all government services then the government doesn't need to collect my consent because remember what we spoke about a while back is that if i'm availing of any services by the state or if i need to get a license um then the state has access to my personal data it doesn't need my consent um uh, if the aadhar does become mandatory then that makes it easier for the state to access my personal data it doesn't have to go to the income tax department to uh, trai to get different data sets it just has to go to the uida uh one of the things about the aadhar case if i'm correct is it's also deciding whether the act itself is constitutional so assuming that it's ruled unconstitutional then this question will be moot but if it is held to be constitutional then yes what will aadhar's impact be on data protection and how this bill addresses that will be questions that we will have to address right and there are some one or two amendments proposed in the report that has come out right to the aadhar bill um Yes, there are a couple of amendments that are proposed to the Aadhaar Act under the bill. Uh, I haven't read them yet, so I don't think I should be commenting on it before reading. Okay, we'll follow up on that in the future. All right, thanks, Mansa and Ajay. Uh, where do we go from here? You have this draft law that's out, draft bill, sorry. Uh, and what comes next? Uh, it's not clear if. there are going to be consultations on this bill and the report it's unlikely because uh, the government may want to have this passed in this session if not by the end of the year um but you know for what it's worth there is a lot of constructive discussion happening uh, around the bill and we hope that these dialogues bring in desirable changes when it is debated in parliament so given that this is being debated by a lot, lot of people it might be difficult for the government to push through something that does not have broad support right hopefully, hopefully. Uh, we hope yeah. that that's the case <laughs> all right all right on that note of hope thanks mans and ajay thank, thank you, you so much this has been fun thank you for staying with us till the end if i could briefly summarize this discussion we had with mansa and ajay we have a new bill on personal data protection there are some good things about it first it gets the language right it makes us the individual the center of the bill however it also pushes the onus of protecting our data on to private entities which collect this information and use it in a variety of ways however this push uh, of the onus to private sector could be extremely complex and uh, it could create an enormous compliance requirement which might make businesses much harder to run at the same time the bill also has quite a few uh, sweeping exceptions for the government which also collects a lot of our personal data so we'll have to wait and watch over the next few weeks and months as to how this draft bill evolves as it maybe enters the parliament and becomes a law If you want to read more about data protection or its frameworks, you can check out Mansa and Ajay's discussion documents on Takshashila Institution's website. You can also go to thinkpragati.com and check out uh, the Think category where there are multiple pieces by Mansa and Ajay, Rahul Matan, Malvika Raghavan, uh, Nikhil Pawa, Saurabh Chandra, and a multiple number of people on how to chart new data protection laws for India. You can subscribe to the Pragati podcast. on the IVM podcast app or wherever else you get your podcast from we are there everywhere some time ago five successful restauranteurs came together to form the kolaba cartel the founders of the table gori devi dayal and jay yusuf partnered with the founders of woodside inn Abhishek Honawar, Pankil Shah, 
and Sumit Gambhir to open a new restaurant in Kolaba. If you've ever dreamed of opening a restaurant or love eating out, you want to listen in. The Kolaba Cartel. This exclusive 10-part series is hosted by Gauri Devi Dayal and Amit Doshi. Look, up in the internet, it's a meme. No, it's a cat video. No, it's the Geek Fruit podcast. That's right. We interrupt this riveting broadcast to tell you about our show, The Geek Fruit Podcast, where Tejas Dinkar and I, Jishnu, talk about everything in pop culture, including DC, Marvel, Star Wars, Netflix, and everything in between. You know how your friends hate it when you ramble about some nerdy crap and you just want somebody to listen to you? Well, sorry, there's nothing we can do about that, but come listen to us ramble and it'll almost be like the real thing. Kind of. Listen to new episodes of the Geek Fruit Podcast every Monday and the Geek Fruit Bulletin every Thursday on iTunes, Google Podcasts, the IVM app, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Happy listening, you nerds.